of this piecemeal approach to what HHC is able to do, but I think, um, and I know that the commissioner is also, I think that how the city, um, even the intake forms at city hospitals, sometimes people that, if the police are bringing a person who is emotionally disturbed or, or suffering some, from some sort of uh, a mental health disorder to a city hospital, it may be apparent that that person is a former service member. They don't walk in with a placard on their, around their neck that says, I am a veteran, you know, or, you know, I served in the Army or whatever it was. So I think that if there is a way for us to, we have the, the, the facilities, we have the real estate, even if we were able to run support groups at city hospitals, for instance, and partner with doctor's council, the, the, the physicians in those hospitals, uh, you know, once a month, you know, as a pilot program in, in, in certain hospitals. And then the city council and the mayor's office help publicize that with the advocates to see what type of, you know, feedback that we get. Because maybe there are other issues there, too, that we don't fully recognize uh, that, that, you know, might be long-term or costly in nature. And then we need to plan for that. We can't just throw money and say, oh, here's a million dollars. Go help everybody uh, who's a caregiver who's, who's uh, being affected by the fact that they're, you know, helping somebody because they, you know, they, they have um, hidden scars or, or physical disabilities, so. Yeah, um, an interesting point which uh, Molly brought up in her testimony is that uh, part of the problem is the service eras and so forth, which actually was brought up during uh, another discussion which we testified at as part of the New York City Veterans Alliance uh, with determining resource databasing and so forth. Um, but it's the, it's the determination thereof and, and figuring out how to properly categorize and how caregivers can even find these resources when they are available. And I think that you're touching on this very appropriately in terms of being able to not only uh, list them and find them, but also make sure that uh, the caregivers, family members, and even the veterans themselves to then help their families find them. Can, can adequately refer them. And I think that we can, uh, I think that there are a lot of partnerships available within the room uh, to be able to, to work together, to be able to get something uh, working through the city, through the city and through the city council to be able to push that forward. But it's definitely gonna take a lot more knowledge because the, the programs, each one has their limitation for example, we're, we're doing something with equine therapy right now, which is only available to the veterans, but then there's another program which is only available to uh, caregivers of post 9-11 veterans, and then another one only available to Vietnam veteran uh, spouses. I mean, like, everybody has their, their niche, and we need to work around that, and I think that um, it's gonna take a very detailed proposal and a lot of of work and help, and uh, a few more, few more testimonies from hopefully a few more educated folks in the room on um, some of the opportunities that are out there as well. I just want to add two very quick last thoughts in terms of specific things that I think the council can have an impact on. The first one would be that we just heard really fantastic testimony from DVS about the data that they're getting on veterans in New York City. Um, and so it would be really great to see that data extended to actually looking at who are veteran caregivers in New York City and what actually are their needs. Um, if they are getting that CRM software and they have the ability to capture that data, it absolutely should be captured. And then the second thing I'll add is that the resolution that New York signed when they became a hidden hero city also mentioned that there should be a single point of contact for caregivers. Um, I'm not aware if that person has been chosen. It said it could either be public or private partnership. So the let's make sure everyone let the knows record that. show that uh, DVS has uh, has yeah. a, uh, appointed or selected the person yeah. to uh, Tanya Thomas. To Tanya Thomas, Thomas right? That out, we'll make sure that, uh, that's very important. Yeah, let's make sure absolutely everyone knows. Yeah, that's great. Look, Tanya, thank you for uh, for what you do. 
for the caregivers. Um, two final questions for the panel, and then we're going to go on to the next panel because we have three others. Again, we could go on for hours, but I love this. This everybody's passion and dedication that you bring to this particular issue just shows how much love and care there is and genuine concern for veterans in the city. So for the folks that are watching online that can't be with us today for whatever reason, you are loved, you are cared for, and there are people here that are fighting on your behalf and for you. So I want to thank you. I want to talk about the study because you, you referenced the study in, um, throughout each testimony that you rated, you know, two stars or three stars. I forget, you know, not stars, but I think you said like 2.3 or 3.4 out of 5. So how many people were actually included in that survey? When was that survey completed? I see you, you did provide the metrics on the back, and I know it was a survey monkey thing, which is, mm -hmm. which is fine, and I have the questions here, but how many respondents and then how did you capture, you know, how did you, how did you target that sample population? Like who took the survey and how were they able to take the survey? That's all I'm interested in. So the it the was, methodology, I guess. It was just a quick survey we sent out just to New York City Veterans Alliance members. So, ha so uh, how many members do you have? You have we about? have 150-ish. Okay. So you have 150. So you and emailed them the link to the Survey Monkey mm -hmm. survey. And then they... It was all a specific link to each person, so they could only answer it once. Okay. Um, and they all took it. It was about a six-question survey. And they how many out of the 135 took it? 60? 40. 48. 48. Okay. Um, no, that, that's pretty good. So the participation it, is pretty good. It was like a, a two-day turnaround, so Great. it wasn't a long-term thing. Um, but so we they just only had a few days, a, though, right? It wasn't yeah. like left out there for months, and nope. then people who were upset with whatever, they got to go on no, and register. No, it was <laughs> late last week. We put it out, and we closed it on Friday evening or okay. Saturday afternoon. <clears throat> Um, so it was very short and quick questions just to get a feel yeah. for how, what our members are thinking. The, o the only thing, and I'm, I'm channeling my Baruch College uh, statistics professor now at the grad school, the only thing that I always worry about in these surveys is the propensity to answer. You sure. know, that people who are unhappy are the ones that are inclined to be like, yes, you know, I hated that restaurant, or yes, I hated that uh, experience at the VA. And the people who are generally satisfied mm -hmm. You know, like, they're like, everything is fine. I don't have to answer the survey. So it's, you know, like, there, there's always that potential for bias. You know, so the, I, I, I know that you factor that into your margin of error, if you will, or, or um, your general analysis mm -hmm. of the survey. But, you know, just because you sent it to 135 people and 48 people responded, which is a great, you know, participation in terms of the percentage-wise, that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, like all the members don't oh, like sure. the outreach specialists, or all the members don't, uh, or, or that those individuals speak for all the veterans in the city, right? So that's, I think that's uh, significant. Because there are other surveys, I'm sure that NYU has outpatient surveys that, you know, peop that probably show, you know, some things they need to work on, but people are generally satisfied with the services that they're getting there. And the VA probably does uh, randomly selected surveys. So, you know, data is so important, but having good data is even more important, I think. So just. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, point out that the the information provided in our testimony is independent of that of theirs survey. because Path, right. uh, Pathfinder is an independent service, um, and ours is accumulated over time. So uh, it's a but we use natural language processors and so that we can pull other information. And so this is very preliminary. This is just what it's currently the rated baseline. at this time. Yeah, this is the baseline data. Yeah, this is data. baseline data yeah. as current. Yeah, Mr. Chair, yeah. I, I would just say I appreciate the, these efforts yeah. to professionalize the uh, data and the sources as well as request the technology. I would say that it's important, for example, you mentioned the paint path versus uh, facilitator versus peer report. If what you're looking for, you're looking for a program that uh, provides training for veterans to learn acting skills, then obviously your answer will be very different than if right. it's a different experience. So I think it's very important. Also, members of the Alliance may have been well informed by the, uh, the inaccurate and, in fact, uh, uh, irresponsible uh, posting that had been uh, initially posted following the uh, announcement of the Field of War program. So I would just say that as a matter of public record, that it's very important as we professionalize our ability to capture who is looking for what and then to rate what they found that we actually make sure that we're comparing uh, similar kinds of 
Yeah, apples to apples, right? Yeah, exactly. So, um, no, it's just it, it, it's just always Chair. something that's in the back of my mind whenever I read surveys or studies. You know, you, you'll see these headlines sometimes in a newspaper, and they can be somewhat uh, misleading. There was something on the radio yesterday, not not related to this, but said that you know kids who spend more than three hours on a tablet or on a smartphone are, are twice as likely to commit suicide. Oh my God, as a parent, I'm like, you know, terrified of this. But when you look at the study and the metrics and you read into it, you see that there was actually more than, you know, there were other um, indicators involved and other things that were involved because it was a controlled group uh, study that they followed. But, you know, when you hear that on the radio, you know, you, you say to yourself, oh, my God, you know, I've got to get my son or my daughter off the iPad, even though they're on educational programs. This is terrible. I don't want to grow up being depressed and suicidal. But, you know, there were other things involved in that. And with surveys, too, is that, you know, the, 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 the population that you select, this is a survey of your members, which is great. The participation rate is great. Uh, but uh, the, the questions right. themselves, you know, might have led people that had negative experiences maybe right. to answer. Right. And um, that's that's. Uh, so that's uh, that's why uh, the integration of uh, independent and unbiased sourcing is why uh, is part of the stress of especially during my testimony. It's because we do not do uh, like only alliance members. We actually poll uh, national uh, a national audience as it is, um, and we are also uh, we're. Not, uh, we're not really interested in that. We're we're interested in what is it over time as people improve, as organizations yeah, improve, and, just, and so look, forth. And I think it's yeah, great. I just want to make sure that uh, it's noted that uh, this result is is separate from the uh, alliance result as it's presented in the testimonial so packet. The, the the alliance, I think it's great. By the way, and again, not to get too technical, we're getting into the weeds, but it is important when you want to take a snapshot of a particular, you know, feeling. I mean that it's not easy to measure qualitatively, but when you want to take a snapshot of a sample population and say, you know, we have 135 members and 50 of them are post 9-11 vets, but we're going to select 15 of those 50, uh, eight men and seven women or vice versa to participate. And we're going to ask them, have they visited a VA? And the ones that answer yes, then we're going to desegregate their responses. Well, then that might be a, a very interesting uh, dynamic to look at, you know, uh, do men get a better experience uh, accessing healthcare at the VA as opposed to women or vice versa? And they're of similar era and uh, they're all part of the same group. Well, then they're, they're homogeneous population to a certain extent, not ethnically, of course, but they're shared experiences. I think that uh, would be very interesting to see if you're able to break down your, your membership even more and then, and then a, take a randomized extrapolation and then get those responses and say we you know and this is a very scientific approach uh, you eliminate the potential for bias and and you make this the survey more valid if, is that correct more valid is that I, I, I wasn't good in English more, more more accurate. To that yeah point, so. so I just um, yeah I absolutely agree with you uh, but this being a quick snapshot of our members and we are willing we if we haven't already provided y'all with the questions and all of the comments, um, we'd be happy to, the uh, anonymous comments. Of course. Um, we'd be happy to. So you can see the questions that we asked and exactly how what happened. But it ended up being a fairly middle of the road, the answers. Yeah. Um, and so I don't think we're making headlines with this one. No, no, I, I, <laughs> no, no, not at and all. I just, just for, for, it's for just the recommendation that I'm making because you have the ability to target a specific part of the population that people like me can't, you know, well, I could, I guess, if I wanted to, but but it, it wouldn't be as easily accessible to other people. You have pe veterans that come to you. You know, you don't have to go to them necessarily. And when you have that information, how do you gauge their opinion about services that they're getting from the city, from the VA, from nonprofit groups or whoever, I think could be very valuable to us as, as policy makers and deci decision makers. But what we look for is the methodology and the the breakdown and the I think it's great by the way I want to I, I don't want to uh, you know rain on the parade but I, I like the fact that you use categorical responses I think that's great you know you didn't say like you know do you like the VA yes or no you know it was very I could see that you actually took the time to break down the responses and you you went to uh, great lengths to try to be as fair and balanced as you can but if there was any way just to really just whittle this down 
bring it back to a future hearing on another topic and make sure that it's the, the, the population is randomly selected, it's homogeneous, and that you know you did everything that you could to eliminate as much bias as you could, I think that would be extremely, extremely helpful with respect to uh, veterans' access to homeless services, job uh, placement assistance or job training programs, or interactions with DVS or the VA or whatever it is that the oversight hearing uh, could be on. If you could survey your members and do it in a way that is more statistically correct, sure. that would be like gold. I mean, that you'd be the only one bringing that to the table. And and let me address. Let me highlight another positive outcome of the survey. It is the communication aspect of it. Right. So we received the survey last week. We engaged DVS. Um, Eric Henry had a conversation and brought it back to the table. So that's something as we both refine our statistical data, so to speak, with the CRM and our own, uh, you know, stati statistical in-house surveys. But what what that forces us to do is have a conversation around the issues and then reach common ground and then bring it back here to the committee. Thank you so much. I, I think it's great, and I, I want to thank you for the work that you're doing, and especially. You know, here's a, a young group of uh, dynamic people who could be out doing other things, making money or, you know, spending the, the holiday week with your family or your loved ones. I mean, I'm, I'm just saying that you took time out to sit here for hours and hours and just listen to the members of the committee, to listen to the administration, to offer your own suggestions. You're, you are continuing to serve. And for the pe you know, you're not just speaking to me and the members of this committee. You're speaking to an audience of veterans and the people that love and care about veterans, and a lot of them can't speak up for themselves, and they can't be here with us today. So I want to thank you all for your testimony today. Thank you. Thank you. Next, next panel. Next panel. Thank you again. Danielle Bracco, Providus, uh, Teachers College, Columbia University, I think, right? Okay, great. Okay, uh, Joe Hunt is here, our friend Joe Hunt. Mental Health Association, New York City. Okay, Adam Friedman, David Lynch Foundation. And Ann Fetter, USVA says, right? Oh, great. Yeah. Chair, I just want to apologize to the panel. I have a vote across the street, but I'm gonna to try to make Thank it you, thank you, Chair, thank you. And at some point, it, I may have to run upstairs to Housing and Buildings, which is on we'll 16. Swap. We'll swap. Yeah, I'll wait for you to get back. Okay, that's fine. That's at one, though. I don't have to. Okay, again, so here are the rules. You get three minutes. I'm very liberal, and I don't cut. This isn't, you know, like Judge Judy. We don't <laughs> cut. We don't cut. Very old. Very liberal. No, well, that's true. Well, the, you know, the election is over, so <laughs> if the shoe fits. Anyway, so... Um, just kidding. Uh, three minutes. We don't cut people off. Uh, we let people go over a little bit. But if, if you have a really, really long testimony, try to cut it down to whatever you can. So um, I, we can start in whatever. What I'm going to learn my lesson from the previous panel. Whatever order you would like to go today is fine with me. Okay. Just turn the mic on and identify yourself if you can for the record. I'm Adam Friedman from the David Lynch Foundation. Um, I want to thank you for having me here. I love telling. Where's Ed Schloman? He always talks about the uh, David oh, Lynch Foundation. Okay. Is, uh, is he? I, I feel he like. He's not here, but we yeah. were with him last week, actually. I'll tell yeah. you about that. He's a fine man. Very and, um, fine man. We're all Ed fans at the foundation. Um, I want to thank you for having me here. I love talking about the way we've had been able to have documented improvement in trauma for veterans. Um, David Lynch Foundation uses an evidence-based form of meditation, specifically transcendental meditation, to reduce trauma in veterans, domestic violence survivors. We also use it in schools. Um, we uh, provide, we teach meditation at the Brooklyn VA, the Manhattan VA, the Manhattan Family Justice Center, schools in Bronx, Brooklyn, South Chicago, and LA. And, uh, I remember when I first, the first day I came to the foundation, I remember our, our veterans teacher said to me, he talked to a counselor at the VA, said to him, this is unreasonably effective on veterans. And I remember hearing that and it struck me, but I'm like, 
I'm kind of like a talk is cheap kind of guy, so I'm like, let's let's see. And part of my job was to collect surveys from veterans that we taught meditation to on improvements in trauma, depression, and sleep. And the last year, I'm glad we have a Baruch statistician here to, uh, so I can go into some numbers. Uh, we had 233 veterans in that year uh, do pre-surveys, and 77%, almost 180, did post-surveys. We saw a 51% reduction in trauma symptoms, a 42% reduction in, in depression, and a 25% improvement in sleep quality. And there have been a bunch of randomized control trials that have been published uh, that have similar results usually between a 40 and 45% reduction in trauma symptoms. And what we're doing now is we have a, we thought of the VA, but we now have monthly courses in Transcendental Meditation that are free for veterans at our offices near Grand Central. We also uh, teach uh, veteran service providers for free. And what we're trying to do is increase, since we're at Grand Central, we're accessible to a large percentage of the veterans in New York City. There's actually several veterans in this room who've learned TM through the David Lynch Foundation. And uh, so we la just last week, we're trying to expand the enrollment in these courses. Um, we had a meeting with multiple veteran service providers, including uh, General Sutton in the Office of um, Department of Veteran Services, uh, CUNY Department of Veteran Services, Samaritan Day Top Village, the Veterans Mental Health Coalition. Um, I don't want to leave out anyone, the uh, United War Veterans Council. And so we're hoping, they've seen a lot of them firsthand, how Transcendental Meditation can help trauma in veterans, and they want to help spread the word and get this to more veterans in New York City. I, th I think that's great, and uh, I'm a big fan of, uh, you know, I, I don't want to say holistic approaches. I don't want to uh, put a yeah. label on it that's incorrect, but I think uh, based upon what uh, Ed Sloman has been able to tell me about this, and, and um, I think at one time he, he was looking to help homeless population, also inner city uh, school children, which I think could greatly benefit from uh, transcendental med meditation, cope with stress and deal with things that are going on in their life and not going on in their lives. I think it's such an interesting and, and cost effective. I mean, it's, it's very cheap, yeah. right? Yes, I mean, compared to um, regular sessions at the, you know, for prolonged exposure or other things, there's other problems. I'm, um, I'm just know, wonder, I'm just wondering, is it used in, and, and I'm yeah, being ignorant, is it used in conjunction with traditional medicine? Yes, and, it is not. We okay. do not build this as a replacement oh, okay, um, good. at all. Like right. at the VA, they have, you know, they have a counselor, they have right. services. We encourage people to use. Often people, like we don't encourage people to get off medication. No, not at all. There have no. been studies that show people, you know, at the, uh, at uh, Fort Gordon in Georgia that people who, you know, have the transcendental meditation ended up using less medication. We don't, we say talk to your doctor, you know, but right. there's a lot of benefits so, to it so it is as an adjunctive it, therapy. So it is used in conjunction with, yes, with all traditional medicine right. and traditional mental health services, Correct. which I which I think is significant. Yeah. I mean, it's sort of like a supplemental treatment, yes. if you will. I mean, yeah. I don't. And we've had people say they do better work in therapy at the Family Justice Center with domestic violence survivors. Yeah, I, I think this would be great uh, to see, and maybe the administration might, uh, could be helpful here is to see if we can somehow integrate this even as a trial in one of the uh, uh, veterans treatment courts, for instance. It, you know, because the judge mandates that they plead guilty up front and they have to go through a program and they have to listen to the doctors at the VA and have to stay out of trouble and they have to check in with their mentor once a week or sometimes more than once a week. But if we were somehow able to require um, Transcendental meditation as part of the the treatment uh, program that is mandated by the judge to see if that makes a difference right. in uh, in the uh, recovery or the recidivism or any anything else that we're trying to measure that would be really interesting even if we were able to do it in just one as I, as a pilot study because they, they they go on a yearly basis. So. I do like the idea of that the one thing to be clear about is we always we never want it mandated and that's one of the we want it always to oh, be voluntary. Okay. So it could be a portion of the services offered. And I don't know. I know they've modeled after drug courts, so there's all sorts yeah. of issues with that. But that's well, one they have thing. to follow certain. Yeah. Schedule. So I mean, it's uh, if someone was in. So that's one of the things we have to work out with the veterans treatment. Right. Courts. Okay. I mean, listen. Uh, they they require that they go to AA meetings or or. Uh, um, you know, other type of support uh, 
groups, um, meetings, but I, I, I just think this has such potential that uh, it, any way we can help you. I agree, and I think this. that's a possible, it's just a little bit of a puzzle, but it can be worked yeah. out. Or, you know, even just uh, allowing the city to refer people to, which I know they already we love, do. We, uh, everyone here, veterans at davidlynchfoundation.org, yeah. we encourage you to put it. We have social media posts. So any way you want to promote yeah, I'm our gonna courses. I'm going to post it today. I'm going. I'm love gonna, it. Okay. So I'm going to tweet it and we will put it on Bing, Facebook. Get him the post. Because uh, I just think it's, it's amazing. And I know that um, Ed brought uh, Mr. Yellen to oh, meet yeah, with me Jerry once. Yellen. How is he doing? Uh, well, from what I, I've never met him, but from, yeah. from what I've heard from Ed, I think well. Yeah, know, he's, he he's, always touts he's, Jerry. He's a Yellen. remarkable guy, just a remarkable man, and a, you know the fact that uh, at his age he's just still again still serving, still giving, still fighting uh, for veterans, and he believes in this. He really believes in transcendental oh. med meditation, and he knows what it can do to help turn the life around. I just think it's. Look, it's not going to work for every single person, no. but for the people that can benefit from it the most, we need to do everything we can to thank you to um, get them there. So thank you, and uh, you know, again, budget season is around the corner. If you want to work on a proposal for the council, sold. yeah, you, exactly. Uh, I mean, yeah, we we w would love to expand our our. We have a monthly course. I want that to be weekly. That budget and also yeah. more veterans would be uh, not you. the topic for today's hearing, but just a friendly reminder. I, uh, talk happy. to the administration, talk to us, apply, and try to put something, again, really targeted and specific that is going to reach the people who need the help the most. I think that's probably the best way to put it. Okay, I broke my rule not to ask questions, but I'm just so uh, interested in this particular area. So thank you for Th your time. Thanks for the opportunity and thank the questions. You. Okay. Um, uh, thank you, Councilman Ulrich and Councilman Cohen, the members of the committee, for the opportunity to provide this testimony. My name is Danielle Bracco, and I am the program director of the ProVetus Mentorship Program for Veterans. One of DVS's lead initiatives is its mentorship initiative, which focuses on providing veterans for as a um, veterans a mentor as they transition out of the military service. The initiative is extremely important as research shows that transition stressors veterans face when transitioning into their civilian life, issues with employment, financial difficulties, issues related to housing, issues related to marital and family problems, can worsen a veteran's psychological health. Um, health. Left unaddressed, these transition stressors can have negative effects that not only on the individual veteran, but also his or her family. The U.S. military has realized the critical role of mentorship or sponsorship to address transition stressors when service members navigate a permanent change of station and move from one post um, or base to another through the tra total transition program. Within this program, each active duty service member receives a sponsor that helps him or her with this critical transition domains at the new post or base, such as employment, duty, housing, family, social community, physical activities, and medical care. Prior to DVS's mentorship initiative, unfortunately, no such comprehensive end-to-end -end system existed to proactively engage service members in support of their transition from the military to the civilian sector. ProVetus is proud to partner with DVS on its important um, mentorship initiative. ProVetus is a certified mentorship, mentorship program that helps veterans and service members successfully transition from the military to the civilian sector within five critical domains. One, employment education. Two, housing. Three, family and legal. Four, social, community, and physical fitness activities. And five, medical care. Um, as part of the ProVetus program, volunteer mentors, which our mentors are a mix of um, civilians and veterans, um, in New York City work with transitioning veterans and fill a similar role as a sponsor with the U.S. military. All mentors undergo a 20-hour certification program um, provided by the Resilience Center for Veterans and Families at Teachers College, Columbia University, prior to fulfilling their roles as mentors. We have trained over 120 mentors and have already worked with over 200 veterans with an anticipated 200 more over the next year. The Resilience Center is also conducting a research evaluation of the program and its work with DVS to inform other cities across the United States. The mentorship initiative is part of DVS's Vets Thrive NYC Whole Health Program. This program sets forth a plan to ensure that NYC veterans and their families have access to community-driven whole health services. Vets Thrive New York City is a whole health and community resilience program comprised by a citywide consortium whose members participated in implementing the Core 4 health model. The optimal entry point for veterans in the Core 4 
model is C2, the Peer Connection, in which New York City strives to offer all veterans coming to their NYC um, their own mentor. Through collaboration between mentorship programs like ProVetus and NYC DVS, the veteran is offered tailored services that best meet or his or her needs. Um, this network providers are vetted um, and part of um, NYSERVS, which is an extensive, extensive, dedicated, and online coordination center that coordinates the services for all veterans. Additionally, just recently, Starbucks has committed to providing ProVetus mentors Starbucks gift cards so that the mentorship can occur within designated locations of Starbucks stores in NYC. Um, and so I just wanted to follow. Uh, end with, ProVetus is very grateful for the Council's leadership and commitment to addressing the needs of the NYC veterans and their families. Um, we greatly appreciate the DVS Commissioner General um, Lori Sutton for her leadership and dedication to meeting the transition um, needs in their families. I did. Thank you. That Hi. is, Sorry, that is great. No, you don't have to rush. I just, you know, <laughs> it's just a general rule yeah. of thumb. I think I was going to ask a question, sure. uh, but we ran out of time okay, because sorry. it would have been... Um, unfair to the administration to keep them up so long, yeah. but talk sorry. about how we can remove the stigma of getting um, mental health uh, services, right? Because that's right. a great challenge for providers, but also for government officials. We want to fund things, but you know, it's very intimidating for people who have mental health issues to like get on a train, yeah. go to the VA or go to the NYU or go to Weill Cornell, sit in an office, you know, it's very, so for some people that are suffering from depression <laughs> or substance abuse issues or other things like to actually get them to do that. But you're saying that you'll certify these individuals and Correct. then they will be able to go to like the neighborhood Starbucks and have a cup yes. of coffee and talk to somebody. I think that's phenomenal. I think right. like, why don't we think of this years ago yeah. sort of thing? Yeah. You know, I just think, and it's prob probably costs nothing because they're giving the gift cards for free, yes, right? So, so I just think this is. Engage. And the other thing too is every veteran. Maybe a metro card. That's the only thing that's oh, yeah. missing, right? <laughs> that's I mean, no, I'm serious. A big I mean, that's a request for a lot of our veterans that yes. we work with in our program because even when they're job searching, going to. Well, that sounds like metro a budget request. A I mean, that sounds like, big, honestly, big. that is something that, you know, the government should pay for is to allow veterans or right. counselors to actually go get the help that they need in, right. the, in the form of a metro card. I mean, I had proposed several years ago, and the MTA chair was not too thrilled, that uh, <laughs> in addition to a senior citizen discount, they should give a veterans uh, discount as well, and they don't. You know, we right. just have uh, people with disabilities or senior citizens get discounted fare, but veterans do not. Right. And uh, the subway is very expensive, it's not always reliable, and I think that uh, uh, veterans right. uh, who are New York State residents uh, should be able to uh, get discounted fare. You know, they shouldn't have to be disabled or a senior citizen. They should just be able to get around town. It's very expensive, you yes. know, to access anything in this city. Mm -hmm. Housing, food, transportation, and uh, the easier that we can make it, I think that's one of those barriers that we can remove to help people get <coughs> better access. And I love the work that you do. I had no Thank idea you. that Teachers College, I know Teachers College does great work, but I had no idea that you were actually certifying. Yes. So Lieutenant Colonel jo um, Joe Geraci um, does the training for the mentors. Um, and it really runs the gamut from interpersonal skills, um, and we also have um, representatives from the VA come to talk about suicide. Wow, and, that is wonderful. Um, yeah, and then they go through a certification. And how do people sign up for this? They have to go through DDS, so, uh, or what are they? There's a couple of things. Um, you know, we had existing mentors that will have a great experience and then go back to work or go back to other fellow veterans and say, hey, you know, I'm doing this and I'm having great experiences, and so we sign up through that. And then more recently, with the New York City Initiative, on their webpage, they have um, us and some of the other mentoring organizations that are part of the whole initiative, um, how to become a mentor in New York wow. City. So it, it'll link to each of our organization sites, tell you about the program, and tell you how to become a mentor. You know, it's like us, and the, uh, there's a large um, group of organizations. I have so many constituents that are veterans themselves, and uh, thankfully they are um, not suffering from any, you know, right. PTSD or anything, and they say, how do I get involved? You know, how do I, you know, I, you know, I want to help people one-on-one. -on -one. I don't want to be on the stage. I don't right. want to raise money. I don't want to organize the parade, but I, I want to do something to give back. I think this right. is a great idea. We'll, we'll forward their information yeah, to DBS. I think DBS so many people want to get involved, but they don't know how to get involved. So right. just giving them different opportunities based on time. And right, I think it's very cetera. flexible, but I yeah. think it's, I think, and, and, and then what, how, when does the training actually take place and so how long is it? We try to do it like every semester. Right. Um, so it's probably about like four Wednesdays 
uh, in the evening. An evening, right. Yes, okay, like a, so. from like 6 to 9.30. But they have to go to Columbia, right? Yes, that's, that's yeah. the only, that's I mean, that, currently, that's but as the challenge. program's yeah. growing, we're growing to try to think of other ways to bring it into different areas. Yeah, that, that would be... Uh, that would be ideal. And I mean, in a perfect world, we could be everywhere, oh, but sure. we can't, right? And the so other thing about the mentor program, it's um, our mentor program. It's really important that we have a wide variety of mentors available because we do really, um, our veterans that come in our program have a different, dealing with different challenges. You know, some might be just be looking to, ha you know, assistance with applications for business school. But, you know, recently we had somebody that was formerly homeless, but, you know, had gotten housing, but then really needed a run of the gamut of services. So we needed somebody that was a little more experienced. So we do have like some veterans who are social workers. So, you know, when we match up, we do really take the time to try to match to the right mentor. So is this a new program too? Um, to be so to it's, record, uh, it? it was uh, formerly an organization called Battle Buds. Okay. Um, so it was probably about like a year and a half ago that it started. And it's, it started and it's evolved Westwoods. into this uh, program. Yes. Yeah. And then leading into the mentoring initiative. So we're part of the larger Just and on the on the record, yes. so picks up commission. Oh, sorry. Can, yeah. Part of the concept of the the whole health uh, and community resilience line of action uh, is we've selected early on community leads like Danielle and uh, uh, our other community leads have been working with us over this last year to develop the model. Gabe is our peer to peer uh, uh, lead for on the DVS side, and the concept is that DVS works with our community leads to be able to develop and build out the citywide consortium. So you heard about our initial efforts with C1, Culture, Education, and the Arts, to build that out. C2, we've now got the mentoring initiative with 25 organizations uh, so we can really work together to find the, the best fit. About a month ago, I want to say, uh, we brought together 25 or so of our C3 community holistic service providers so we can learn from them. And then of course, we're gonna follow out within the next uh, few weeks our 25 or so mental health service providers uh, with of course, uh, Headstrong and NYU and the VA and our other uh, providers. But it's a way of, of animating the program with a government lead paired with a community lead, but not stopping there building out then the citywide consortium. So we really just thank everyone who's been involved in this, including you, wanna, uh, Danielle. Thank you, Commissioner. And, and um, I want to piggyback on some of my previous comments. When I spoke to Doctors' Council, SEIU, about the city's um, physicians and some of the nurse practitioners, you know, they have these uh, annual conferences where they invite in different groups to speak. I, I think that this might be a good opportunity for you to speak to you know, not a majority, but a good number of the city's doctors say, hey, you know, this might be available. Contact Commissioner Sutton, and we will try to arrange it around your schedules because they're city doctors. But they're on the front lines of receiving people who are emotionally disturbed or mentally ill or suffering from some other mental health disorder because the police are bringing them either to central booking or they're bringing them to a city hospital. And if that's where we're going to get that population who needs this help the most, I... I think uh, some of these doctors should should uh, be aware of this training and how to identify certain things or ask the right questions. Sometimes they don't right. they don't ask the question the right way, right? I mean, and, and that's not intentional. It's just uh, if you can't identify them, then then it's, it makes it even more difficult. So thank you for for what you do. That's great training. Great great job. Okay, we have uh, the VA and then the Mental Health Association. Um, good afternoon, uh, Chair Ulrich and members of the New York City Council Veterans Committee and Committee on Mental Health. My name is Ann Fader. I'm the Mental Health Program Lead for the VA Hospitals in Downstate New York. You probably know that includes the Bronx and their clinic in Queens, as well as the New York Harbor VA and with their campuses in Brooklyn, Manhattan, Queens, and a clinic in Staten Island. Um, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this hearing on mental health services for New York City veterans. Um, outreach efforts to veterans in collaboration with the community are the highest priority for the VA. Additionally, the Secretary of VA, Dr. David Shulkin, has identified reducing the rate of veterans as one of veteran suicides, excuse me, as one of his five priorities. Since 14 of the 20 veterans who take their lives daily have not been connected 
with the Veterans Health Administration. It is absolutely critical to make concerted, widespread efforts to connect with as many agencies, providers, organizations, and individuals as possible to see what we can do together to reduce this tragic number. VA community collaboration takes many forms and involves multiple services within our own agency. Here are some examples of active relationships. Um, both New York City VAs have long-standing partnerships with the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI, which includes running family-to-family -family education programs and more recently the implementation of Project Homefront. Veterans and their families have participated in these support programs for over seven years. A key community service is provided by our VITAL program. VITAL is a funny word, but it stands for Veterans Integration to Academic Leadership and is run out of the New York Harbor VA. It's in his fourth year of operation and a full-time VA psychologist offers a myriad of services to veterans on college campuses across New York City, which includes access to VA healthcare, on-campus counseling, and care coordination. The college is involved at Baruch College, Columbia, Queensboro, New York College, LaGuardia, Fordham, St. John's, John Jay, and NYU. A work-study program has also been established that offers students training in outreach and engagement and then expands the ability to engage new student veterans in the VITAL program. During the past year, the emphasis has been on establishing a program within the walls of Columbia and their new resilience center. It has become the most important hub of our VITAL program, and it's able to meet with student veterans from any school at that location. VITAL saw close to 400 veterans in the last fiscal year. The New York Harbor also has a strong partnership with NYU's Military and Family Clinic, offering bi-directional referrals and even providing space for NYU staff to interview clients at the VA. This has been helpful for families of veterans seeking care outside of the care of the veteran for veterans opting not to receive VA and for those veterans that are ineligible for VA care. Um, the VA, and we've heard a little bit about this, has a robust veterans justice outreach program that works in jails, courts, and veterans courts in all five boroughs. We have three full-time VJO coordinators whose primary, pur Ooh, dear. whose primary purpose <laughs> is to help these veterans receive mental health and other services and to find alternatives to incarcer incarceration where they can. This past year, New York State was selected as one of eight states to participate in the Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinic Project funded by SAMHSA, the Department of Health and Human Services. One of the criteria is to offer intensive community-based mental health care for members of the armed forces and veterans. There are five community agencies in New York City um, that were selected. The VA has established an MOU which offers military and veteran culture training to their staff as well as care coordination for veterans that may opt to receive it. Um, two VA staff members have been part of the steering committee for the New York City Veterans Mental Health Council for the past eight years, and VA staff have presented at multiple councils and have used these forms to further connect sort of one-on-one -on -one with other agencies and individual uh, veterans. Part of the responsibility of the local VA suicide prevention program is to offer five monthly trainings in the community. Examples of these trainings are at the Veterans Advocacy Project, part of the Urban Justice Center, Jericho Project, Samaritan Village, Vo Volunteers of America, um, Veterans Courts, etc. The VA Mental Illness Research Education and Clinical Center, which is located at the Bronx VA, is collaborating with ProVetus Project. This was arranged before, I didn't just add it now, <laughs> uh, from Teachers College by offering suicide prevention outreach and clinical services to veterans who may be suicidal as identified through the ProVetus online assessments. The goal here is to educate veterans who are not seeking VA services and provide a connection to clinical help if needed. The VA has been involved with the development and rollout of New York Serves, the coordinated network of online services for veterans, services, and their families. The Manhattan and Bronx Vet Center, together with the New York Harbor VA and the Veterans Benefits Administration, are all direct links to the website. Our VA colleagues who work at the vet centers in New York City also have strong co connections with the NYU Military and Family Clinic, the Wild Cornell PTSD program, as well as Project Headstrong, and the New York Presbyterian Military Family Wellness, in that they can refer veterans to them that where they may not be eligible for VA healthcare and or who don't meet vet center combat eligibility. And lastly, our VA homeless programs offer a full continuum of outreach and psycho serv social services to homeless and at-risk veterans which serve as an important conduit to link veterans to needed mental health care. The mental health and homeless programs work in collaboration with multiple community partners to move veterans from a cycle of despair into a circle of care based on their individual needs. 
We see all these efforts as works in progress. No doubt there are ways to further expand these partnerships. Finally, the VA has been honored to be a member of the New York City Department of Veteran Services Core 4 Steering Group, and we look forward to more opportunities to directly collaborate with the department. Um, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Sorry Ms. for going No, it's, it's okay. It's fine. And thank the Veterans Administration and Sue Malley and all of our friends at the uh, – Harbor VA and also the Brooklyn VA, the Bronx VA, the Queens VA. I mean, they just, they do great work and, uh, you know, it, it, it's a great challenge that they have there. And I get a lot of emails from patients. And again, I, sometimes we only hear the negative. We don't always talk about the positive, but there are a lot of positive things going on at the VA. And the thing that pleases me the most to see and to hear is that we are engaging in more public-private partnerships. Yeah, I think okay. the, the thought in the past to always do everything ourselves and be it to be, be all things to all people and a direct provider of everything under the sun, that's not, that doesn't work well. It just doesn't work. And so I think the VA has, has identified and partnered with some really terrific organizations that specialize in certain types of treatment and training and other aspects of mental health. And, uh, and you've, brought, you've literally brought them into the VA. 10 and 20 years ago, that would be unheard of. I mean, how, how many years have you worked for the VA, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, I, I don't mind at all. Over 30. Over 30. So I mean, I've when, you, all, when right? you started your career 30 years ago, were they letting nonprofits come in and no. use the space for free no. to provide no. services exactly. for veterans? No. They were, they were so protective of, you know, their population, their patients, and they came up with all these rules as to why they couldn't do things, and they forgot what their mission was, which was actually to right. help people. So I think it's... Uh, I think it's great to hear, and I think um, you and your colleagues are doing great work. And and um, I just want to say thank you to the VA because they they do a great job in New York. Mental Health Association. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Councilman Ulrich, uh, for this opportunity to provide testimony regarding mental health services to New York uh, City area veterans. My name is Joe Hunt. I'm an Army veteran, and I serve as director of the Veterans Mental Health Coalition which is administered by the Mental Health Association of New York City. For the past 50 years, the Mental Health Association has provided direct services, public education, and advocacy to address the needs of New Yorkers living with behavioral health needs. In addition to overseeing the Veterans Mental Health Coalition, <coughs> the, the uh, MHA provides training and technical assistance as well as backup call center support for the Veterans Crisis Line that connects veterans, their families, and caregivers with qualified Department of Veterans Affairs counselors who can respond effectively to crises and other emotional health concerns. The uh, Mental Health Association of New York City and the Veterans Mental Health Coalition supported the creation of the New York City Department of Veterans Services to meet the needs of New York City's more than 200,000 veterans and applauds the department's comprehensive approach to addressing the mental health and emotional well-being of veterans through its core for whole health model. This integrated approach is in keeping with current best practices in behavioral health and has been demonstrated that the most positive outcomes occur when supports are able to consider multiple domain functions including social, emotional, and mental health. In addition, the Veterans Mental Health Coalition worked with DVS to identify evidence-based holistic modalities in which New York City veterans may be referred and will continue to collaborate, continue to work collaboratively with DVS to help develop a sustainable model for delivery of holistic services to veterans and their families. The Veterans Mental Health Coalition is a diverse membership made up of 900 members and more of more than 370 different organizations representing housing, legal services, academic institutions, hospitals, mental health providers, as well as city, federal, and state agencies. The majority of our members are civilian providers who seek information and training about the culture and unique needs of veterans and their families in order to become more effective in delivering their services. The importance of this information and training we provide uh, to largely a civilian non-mental health provider is underscored by the RAND Corporation study, which indicated that more than half of New York State service members returning to civilian life have psychological injuries. As there are more than 200,000 veterans in New York City at present, that means that over 100,000 New York City veterans may be struggling with clinically significant mental health symptoms. The RAND study 
also indicated that only one third of the veterans in need sought mental health treatment, highlighting the need for outreach to veterans and their families through the non-mental health provider community in order to increase the veterans' access to care. At a recent briefing at the Institute of Veteran and Military Family Services, IVMF, which oversees NYSERVS, it was reported that veterans contacting uh, their network requested an average of four types of services, including housing, benefits, employment, and legal services. Less than 2% of all callers requested behavioral health services. Veterans have their own priorities. Based on these statistics, coupled with the, the understanding that two-thirds of veterans with mental health needs do not seek treatment, it is reasonable to extrapolate that approximately 67 out of every 100 veterans with mental health needs are seeing non-mental health providers. 67 out of every 100 veterans with mental health needs are seeing non-mental health providers. The solution, this non these non-clinical providers require the knowledge and skills necessary to effectively identify and address mental health needs. At a minimum, they need a basic understanding of military culture, how to identify signs and symptoms of mental health challenges, and techniques to engage at-risk veterans to ensure that they are connected to culturally and clinically competent sources of care. New York City has behavioral health services available through three VA services, uh, facilities in the Bronx, Manhattan, and Brooklyn. However, it's been documented that nearly half of New York City veterans uh, saw, who needed treatment preferred to receive their care through civilian-based providers in their own communities, much like everyone else. New, New York City veterans and their families are fortunate to be able to avail, avail themselves to specialized services offered by the Stephen A. Cohen Military Family Clinic at NYU Langone, Headstrong, and the New York Presbyterian Military Family Wellness Center, to which veterans and their families can be referred. However, as veterans and their families also seek treatment from non-specialist behavioral health providers, it is also critical that these general clinical providers identify the veterans they're serving and demonstrate the cultural competence needed to ensure effective engagement and delivery of clinical interventions. We look forward to continuing work with DVS to support its efforts to meet the mental health challenges of veterans and their families. The Mental Health Association of New York City and the Veterans Mental Health Coalition are grateful to the New York City Council's leadership and commitment to addressing the needs of New York City's veterans, and in particular, their met mental health challenges. And we greatly appreciate uh, New York City's Department of Veterans Services Commissioner Sutton for her leadership and dedication to meeting the integrated needs of veterans and their families. The MHA looks forward to continuing our work with the Council and the current administration to continue to make New York City a place where the emotional well-being of veterans, <coughs> active duty military, their families, and caregivers can flourish. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. I just want to clarify one part of your testimony. You mentioned 67 out of 100 are seeing non-clinical providers. Can you can you clarify that, or did no. I hear that wrong? No, that's 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 correct. It's just based on the extrapolating from the RAND study and the study. Of the report from the IVMF about the callers to NYSERVS. And you, and you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? I'm asking for a value judgment here. Well, I think it, it, it indicates <coughs> that we need to do more to educate non-mental health providers and encourage them to have a mental health partner use and, and have a technique for using their trusted physician to make a referral once they've been able to identify that that veteran may be at risk. So this is um, more of an integrated model. You're trying to encourage uh, the non-clinical providers to partner with or, I guess, uh, become associated with a, a, a psychologist or, or, or a mental health center or Some, something. Okay. With a clinician, or, yes. Or, or with a clinician. That's very interesting. I mean, we're getting back to David Lynch, uh, Foundation and Transcendental Meditation doing it sort of in concert with one another. They're not in competition with one another. Some people seek out non-traditional forms of treatment uh, for their own personal reasons. They're, they don't like taking medicine. They don't like hospitals. They don't, whatever the reason is. But 
I think your point is also important to, to try to train or provide some sort of uh, referencing for the non-clinical providers to uh, to be able to identify, you know, this person is schizophrenic and needs more than just transcendental <coughs> medic meditation. He needs, you know, psychotherapy. I mean, like, there's certain things, I think, to look for that they can make uh, better referrals, I guess, and say, you know, I'm happy to help, but I think you really need to speak with this person, too. Um, behavioral health in particular, and I think that that's where the city encounters a large swath of the veterans that come into the, uh, the criminal justice system in particular, probably a majority of them have behavioral health issues because they wouldn't be there otherwise, uh, but also the city hospitals too. I mean, and being able to identify what some of those issues are or symptoms and then being able to make the right referrals I think is, uh, is key. But I want to thank you. I know you do such a great job putting everybody under one umbrella and trying to talk to one another. For a long time, that, that was a criticism that people had of MOVA going back 30 years, is that you know everybody was doing their own thing and we couldn't bring everybody under one umbrella. But now that we have DVS, I think they're really starting, well, they, they are doing it, but they're, they're not only doing it, but they're expanding that network now and they are communicating and talking with one another and that's making things a whole lot better. So I yes, we, we uh, collaborate uh, frequently with DVS because part of our, a big part of our role is to make sure that the rest of the community understands what's going on in the mental health area and and what's going on at D the changes that are going on in DVS because that's a chiropractic for us all. Right. I have one, one question. I, I know we like to share best practices and talk about what works well. Can you recall in your experience or in your consortium something that hasn't worked well, something that's not working? Um, what is a weak link in the, in, the, in the fence here when it comes to mental health in, in, the, uh, in the city? Well, I, I, would, I have to answer that question in a different way because I'm not a cl clinician. I can tell you with the Veterans Mental Health Coalition, what we've learned is that talking at the provider community and telling them what they should be doing has not been all that effective. Because what we discovered was we've done two events on partnerships. The first was to talk about a part of two large organizations that partnered. And uh, we realized that most providers are small organizations. And when we talk about partnerships, they think of corporations getting together in some sort of formal relationship. But we're encouraging all sorts of collaborative relationships. In fact, NYU brought it to our attention. The NYU uh, Cohen Clinic brought it to our attention when they told us they had over 190 different relationships some formal, some informal. So we held another partnership event and we used uh, The Bridge and, we, uh, and uh, Headstrong as examples of organizations that had partnerships as part of their strategic plan. And in the course of kind of the aftermath of that event, we discovered that many providers don't know how to think about who to partner with and how to go, go about it. It was news that you can't go to a DVS or NYU Langone Clinic to be a partner looking for money because everyone is, is you know, supported by funding. So it's not a source of funds. It's a source of expanding the service and access. And partnerships do two things that meet our, our mission, which is one, they improve access for veterans, but they also improve the quality of care because you aren't going to, uh, I can't think of anybody that's gonna partner with someone that's ineffective. Wow, so much stuff to cover. Anyway, okay, I want to thank you for your uh, testimony, each of you, and uh, we're going to call up the next panel now. Thank you. Last panel of five. Last panel of five, okay, all right. Such a great hearing, such a great hearing. You have to give me your, uh, what you want me to share on social media for. Yeah. Uh, you know, send it to me, my staff, it's fine. Yeah, send it to me. Thank you. No, I'd, I'd love to do that. That'd be great. Okay, last panel, last but not least, as they say, from the Stephen A. Cohen Military Family Clinic, we have Irina Wen. Okay, we also have uh, Gerard Ilaria. Is that correct? From NYU Langone? Did he step out? Oh. Okay. All right, well, I called him up. Um, how about Samantha Kubek? Is that correct? Quebec. Okay, sorry about that from uh, New York Legal Assistance Group, NILAG, our friends at NILAG. Thank you for being here. Uh, Coco Cohane, MVP from day one, I remember. She was here at the first hearing and 
She's still here, and so am I, so that's a good sign. And uh, Miguel. Um, Oka Gerda? Osegerda, I'm sorry. I, might, I went to Catholic school, as I know. That's the handicap uh, from Headstrong Project. So why don't we begin with Irina, and then we'll just work our way down the panel. And you can begin at your, your leisure. Thank you. Okay, I think it's on now, thank you. Uh, so thank you so much for inviting testimony from our organization today at NYU and New York City Council Committee on Veterans. I am Dr. Irina Wen and I'm a clinical psychologist and director of the Stephen A. Cohen Military Family Clinic at NYU Langone Health. I'm here today to testify on behalf of the Military Family Clinic on the topic of mental health services for NYC area veterans. The Stephen A. Cohen Military Family Clinic at NYU Langone was established five and a half years ago in July 2012 with a goal to fill in the gaps in services available for veterans, but also their families in our area. The toll of war and military service is high on service members and their loved ones alike, and mental health struggles are not uncommon. Yet they're often left unaddressed and potentially leading to unemployment, loss of housing, damaged relationships, and at times tragic loss of life by suicide. Our clinic's mission is to address the mental health challenges by providing accessible, high quality, integrative treatment to veterans and their family members. We strive to remove all barriers to care through a number of ways, by providing our services um, completely free of charge, by offering them to veterans regardless of their discharge status, combat exposure, um, or era served, and by opening our services not only to veterans but their family members who we define very broadly, and also by offering services not only face-to-face -face, but also through a telemental health platform that allow us to reach those individuals who are unable to come in in person due to geographical, emotional, or other practical reasons. Our clinic addresses a wide range of mental health concerns, including post-traumatic stress, traumatic brain injury, depression, anxiety, and other many various challenges. The services we provide include individual, couples, family, and group therapy, parenting training, psychiatric evaluations, medication management, uh, neuropsychological assessments, and others. Um, in addition to our core clinical program, we have established several specialty programs to, with the goal of addressing specific needs that we have identified in the veterans community in New York City. Dual diagnosis program offers uh, flexible, integrative care for veterans struggling uh, or family members struggling with addiction and mental health concerns at the same time. And we employ harm reduction approach that provides flexibility in setting treatment plans and goals and can vary between patients, so it's not just abstinence-based. Goals may include reduced harm or full abstinence, and treatment may include individual therapy, group therapy, and medication management. We also have established traumatic brain injury program with the generous support by, uh, from New York City Council to fill in the gap in this treatment, and we provide a full psychological, neuropsychological assessment and also interventions for veterans who suffer from mild to moderate TBI. We have a separate child and family program um, that addresses the needs of children's and children and family members of the veterans. And we also have established telemental health program that provides mental health care to veterans and families in every part of New York City and New York State who are unable to regularly commute to therapy. And services are easily provided via computer <coughs> or tablet and can be done in privacy of their homes. Building a successful service delivery model uh, requires strong partnerships that we talked about so much today. Over the past five years, we have developed robust reciprocal relationships with over 106, almost 200 agencies that serve veterans and their families. These relationships allow building a network of referrals and sharing and maximizing our resources. While many relationships are informal, 
Others are legally formalized. For example, memorandum of understanding have been instituted with a number of agencies, including Manhattan VA, Fort Hamilton Army Base, Fort Hamilton Schools, and Samaritan Village. Public-private partnerships are particularly important to us in leveraging resources to, for veterans and their families. And in this regard, we have built a strong partnership with Manhattan VA, complementing their services and offering treatment to veterans and their families. And we're honored to partner with the Department of Veteran Services in New York City to support the development um, of building integrated model of care for this important population. And our clinic is a part of Vets Thrive NYC Citywide consor Consortium aimed at providing the li uh, improving the lives of New York City veterans and their families. And thank you so much for allowing me to testify today. I appreciate all the efforts of the, of the leadership here. Thank you. Uh, so that I don't forget, mm -hmm. how long is the treatment, uh, if, if I'm a veteran that go, uh, and I have bad sure. paper for argument's sake, and I go to NYU Langone, and I have, you know, several issues I need to deal yeah. with, how long can I get treatment there, for, for how long? The bad paper, good paper doesn't matter to us, yeah. so it's going to be uh, Well, I mean, I'm going there because I can't go to the VA. Right, that, That's exactly. why I bring that up. So, so uh, our, ter our services are what we define short to medium term, and it allows, it's for a reason. So it usually is three to four months okay. of very targeted, goal-driven, uh, evidence-based care, which we apply very flexibly and integratively. So we do rely on evidence-based practices. And that allows us to serve a lot of veterans. So to date, we have served 1,500 uh, 1, veterans and families to date. And, and, and if you don't have this information, it's okay. But what would you say is the number one issue, or ha have you ranked or categorized the types of issues that are coming in? So what is the most prevalent mental health issue that you are assisting veterans with at NYU? One of the highest is post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, actually, that we right. see. Yeah, so what about um, TBI? Is TBI up TBI there? is growing just because our attention and ability to assess it and treat it increased at NYU because we created a traumatic brain injury program. Right. But absolutely, and TBI actually is one of the scans, areas. You do scans, you do brain scans? We don't do brain scans, no, we don't have that capacity. That would be a much more involved program. Now why not? Because um, that's gonna be, we are very open to it, but it's just gonna be, it's much more expensive enterprise of uh, Because I know that you said this, because the city council gives you funding Right, yeah. but are we paying for stuff that you're already doing, or are, are, are no, we no, expanding No, 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 you're paying that? for stuff that we haven't been doing. Okay. Uh, so, for example, through this funding, we're able to hire neuropsychologist who oh, is great. actually providing very detailed neuropsychological battery yeah. to to a lot of veterans who have nowhere else to go, or if they were referred by their by colleges to get that type of evaluation, it will be thousands of dollars. Otherwise. Now, if if they have medical coverage, though, supposing you know that they do have health coverage mm -hmm. and they're still participating in this uh, treatment program can they get a brain scan I, I mean I'm just they potentially can and we can. work with so it's not like you never do no, it no, it's no. just you only do it when you're able to we work with neurology uh, somewhere else we partner up with okay. other agencies to be able to that's important yeah, with TBI I just want to make sure okay. that you're not just you know relying on yes when, when needed we will uh, order and partner up with that's other great. agencies to do this care. That's great. Well, I think you're doing terrific work there. Thank and you're, you very much. You are serving a lot of people with some really expert care. The City Council Committee took a tour. Mm -hmm. Were you on that tour? I don't remember. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. I'm sorry. But uh, I know we met several uh, folks from down there, yeah. and uh, we were very impressed with the model and the location and the services that are being provided there. So we look forward to hopefully supporting the good work in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Irina. Thank you. Okay, headstrong. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, uh, Chair Ulrich and uh, Chair Cohen, who I think left already. Uh, Commissioner Sutton uh, and members of the uh, Veteran Committee Council for allowing me to speak on behalf of Headstrong Project, a uh, pioneering mental health care program that provides unlimited, cost-free, confidential, and comprehensive mental health care to post-9-11 military veterans and their families, uh, developed in partnership with the Department of Medicine at Wall Cornell Medical College. Headstrong successfully launched a pilot pro treatment program and began treating veterans in New York City at the end of 2012. Uh, in the end of 2000, by the end of 2015, with strategic planning assistance from Morgan Stanley, 
Petrarm began expanding its treatment program <clears throat> by establishing private market clinical, mar uh, clinical networks in regions we've identified uh, as demonstrating a great need for services. Uh, the veteran-led focus on responsible expansion has allowed Headstrong to establish and currently manage private practice networks to provide care in Houston, San Diego, Chicago, Los Angeles, Washington, D.C., Denver, Colorado Springs, and more recently, with the support of the New York State Health Foundation, have began implementing and integrating a telemental health uh, program to address uh, geographic barriers to care experienced by veterans living in these regions of New York. Uh, which include currently now Rochester, Ithaca, Buffalo, Syracuse, and soon Albany and Orange County. Uh, currently, we have over 250 veterans enrolled in our, in our trauma treatment program. 103 of them are here in New York City. Uh, to date, we've treated over 450 veterans, delivering over 7,000 individual client ses uh, sessions. Uh, and thanks to a recent investment in our CRM platform, Headstrong is able to engage veterans uh, seeking services well within the 48-hour window, but more importantly, track their progress throughout their time throughout their time of treatment. Um, utilizing the belief that our nation's most deserving citizens deserve the best of care as a pillar for clinical partnerships, Headstrong's uh, clinical team consists of a reputable and skilled psychiatrists, addiction psychiatrists, psychologists, and licensed clinical social workers in private practice with multiple years of experience treating trauma and a passion for addressing mental health disparities in veteran populations. To date, Headstrong has established clinical partnerships with 102 clinicians nationwide, 20 of, 22 of them here in New York City and counting. Um, Headstrong's cornerstone treatment for traumatic uh, memory processing, eye, uh, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, or EMDR, allows a veteran and clinician to address difficult memories that inform an overactive nervous system, leading to symptom resolution and overall well-being. The VA uh, and the Department of Defense and Institution of Medicine recognize EMDR as one of the most effective evidence-based therapies for PTSD, but also recognize a critical shortage of qualified EMDR therapists within the national VA system. Headstrong is currently the only national 501c3 organization that exclusively offers EMDR as a primary trauma treatment modality, along with other evidence-based modalities like CBT and CPT, to individually trailer, uh, tailor treatment to the needs of veteran or military service member. Each veteran receives a comprehensive intake and psychiatric evaluation that Headstrong utilizes to identify psychotherapists best suited in skill set and geographic proximity to meet the needs of each client. To treat the individual needs of each veteran, Headstrong creates an individualized integrated recovery program that follows three stages of trauma recovery, stabilization, memory reprocessing, and reintegration. Unlike most treatment programs that end in crisis intervention or stabilization and cap benefits, Headstrong invests in a veteran's individual competencies to enhance overall well-being and improve quality of life. By focusing on all stages of trauma recovery, Headstrong bolsters innate resilience and empowers each veteran to make resilient transition from meaningful military service to civilian life. Our current clinical uh, data recently analyzed demonstrated 75% improved sleep, 83% fewer flashbacks, 71% decrease in hypervigilance, 59% uh, in improvement in relationships, 68% reduction in avoidance, 86% reduction in suicidal ideation, 77% improvement in school or work, um, just to name a few, and one more, and then 87% improvement in mood. Uh, lastly, integral to the vision of creating a lasting change in veterans' mental health, Headstrong recognizes that effective trauma treatment is one component of a multi-dimensional uh, multi paradigm and requires asset-based community partners, uh, partnerships with organizations that align with Headstrong's values and mission. Uh, through partnerships with organizations such as Team RWB, the mission continues, Travis Mannion Foundation, Veterans Mental Health Coalition, and Department of Veterans Services here in New York City, uh, to name a few, many of them with robust programs here in New York City, Headstrong shifts attention away from pathology and dysfunction amongst veterans uh, towards mental fitness, community action, and other healthy determinants that foster positive health-seeking behaviors. Ultimately, Headstrong aims to create greater synergy between effective trauma treatment and public health in innovative, in innovative ways that can improve overall mental health in the veteran population here in New York City. Uh, thank you all for allowing me to testify on behalf of Headstrong, and pending any questions, that concludes my testimony. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, 
I might have a question. I'll come back to it. But uh, we'll go to Samantha and then Coco. Not today. Okay. There we go. <laughs> Chair Ulrich and Cohen, council members and staff, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Samantha Kubek, and I'm an Equal Justice Works Fellow at the New York Legal Assistance Group in our Legal Health Division. Legal Health partners with medical professionals to address the non-medical needs of low-income New Yorkers with serious health problems. This year, our Veterans Initiative will serve nearly 1,000 veterans through our legal clinics at the VA hospitals in New York. Veterans from all periods of service are affected by mental health diagnoses. 20% of veterans from the Iraq and Afghanistan conflict suffer from major depression or PTSD. 26% of veterans from the Vietnam era have experienced PTSD at some point in their lives, with about 15% still suffering today. As an attorney with Legal Health, I staffed the nation's first legal clinics for women veterans at the VA hospitals in the Bronx and Manhattan. The overwhelming majority of my clients are survivors of military sexual trauma, MST, which includes pervasive harassment, rape, and sexual assault during the military. Women veterans are two times more likely to experience PTSD than their male counterparts, and sexual assault victimization is related with high lifetime rates of PTSD in both men and women. Many women veterans are often unable to maintain employment as a result of these diagnoses and struggle financially, unfortunately leaving many homeless. Women veterans are three times more likely to be homeless than civilian women, and more than half of homeless women veterans are MST survivors with the resulting mental health diagnoses. Lastly, women veterans are 250% more likely than civilian women to commit suicide. I'd like to tell you about one of my clients, who I'll call Susan, who came to my clinic suffering from extreme depression, anxiety, and PTSD, stemming from her rape during the military. She had been out of the Army for 34 years and was living on food stamps, but had been unable to get service-connected benefits, largely due to the severity of her conditions. Her PTSD was such that she was unable to draft the statement needed to complete her claim and present the evidence required by the VA to get her benefits. But with the help of an attorney, she was able to obtain her long overdue benefits, totaling a back pay of over $60,000 and ongoing monthly payments of $3,000 a month for as long as her condition persists, likely the rest of her life. These benefits provided her the financial stability she so desperately needed as her diagnoses had left her unable to work and at risk for homelessness. Susan's case demonstrates how access to legal services is a crucial component of caring for our veterans with mental health diagnoses. Attorneys can help keep veterans in stabilized departments and assist in obtaining government benefits. Individuals with mental health diagnoses who have an attorney are more likely to obtain positive outcomes than those who do not have one. The VA's yearly survey of homeless veterans consistently finds legal problems to be among the top 10 unmet needs of this population. This is all the more true when a mental health diagnosis is present. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today and look forward to engaging in further discussions about assisting our veterans in obtaining positive behavioral health outcomes. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Samantha. And uh, David Falcon still helping to run the uh, so veterans in, program at uh, NILAG? Yes, so he's in a separate unit than Legal Health, but yes, he's still working with veterans. So we, my office and the council regularly refers people to him that have uh, VA claims that need help disputing claims, and uh, but maybe we should be referring them some of those people to you because we, I feel like we refer everything to him. So before you leave, you could just leave some of your business cards. Sure, absolutely. So our model is that we're inside of the VA hospitals. We run weekly legal clinics. We have um, in the Manhattan and the Bronx hospitals, we have a clinic in the behavioral health department, the geriatrics department, and in the women's department. And all three of those are weekly. And we also have a clinic in Northport, Long Island. Wow. Um, and we provide a comprehensive civil legal services, so housing, VA benefits, family law, um, federal student loan district. There was a terrible suicide at Northport not long ago. It was just terrible. And I don't know all the particulars, but it's just very sad yeah. to hear those sorts of things. So just before you leave, if you can sure. leave us the uh, information. Coco Cohane. Is here. One of the other mics is on because there's feedback. There's like a loud submit. All right, you turn the other one off. Okay, now, yeah, now it's not as echoey. Okay, Coco Colhane. Hi, I'm Coco Colhane, the director of the Veteran Advocacy Project, and uh, we focus on providing legal services to veterans who have experienced some kind of trauma and their family members. And something that I'm surprised to not hear today is that I think there's a gap in services in New York City when it comes to long-term care. Um, you know, whenever we work on 
you know, conferences nationally, things like that, talking about uh, veterans with bad paper, we are always, we always preface it with we're so lucky to be in New York, uh, not least because of the people at this table. Um, the resources are incredible, but if you're trying to find any kind of long-term care, particularly for someone who served pre-9-11, it's pretty much impossible. Um, we have a client currently who suffered military sexual trauma during service um, and after several months was sent to work with a vet center. Well, we follow up to work on that person and with their claim and turns out he has stopped going. He you know, never even completed intake. Um, that disruption in services can be very difficult, especially for people who um, have trust issues as a lot of people who've experienced trauma do. Um, and I just also wanted to add, um, obviously we specialize in working with veterans who have less than fully honorable discharges. And Secretary Shulkin's announcement is a huge step forward in terms of allowing 90 days of treatment for veterans, but it is only for veterans with an other than honorable discharge. It is not any discharge, it's one type. And the problem is that <clears throat> in the 90 days that the VA is going to review that veteran's service, they're going to look at their personnel file, and their personnel file is most likely not going to explain their misconduct, right? So um, they're likely going to be rejected and then sent back into the community. And it's our responsibility in New York to make sure that there's something waiting for them um, if we send them at all. It's, there's a lot of misinformation. Um, I currently have a veteran with a bad conduct discharge who the VA liaison said, we'll get you in, don't worry about it. And he's now dealing with crushing blow of like, actually, no, we can't help you. And there's too many places where that happens because of eligibility. Um, so in terms of long-term services, we need to think about, you know, all of those veterans who don't have an honorable and who still served. And particularly when it's someone, you know, Marines, Navy, zero tolerance policy, we have people who are barred from VA services because they smoked a joint. Um, and we need, you know, in other states in the country, that is considered proper self-medication. So um, we have a duty to all of those men and women. Thank you. Coco, what about uh, LGBT uh, veterans uh, that have other than honorable discharges? H how are they? How are their ca cases revived or revisited? In, um, the, in the wake of the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. That's so. If they had an honorable, and it's simply that they were discharged because of you know, it'll say sometimes homosexual conduct or something like that. Those are very easy to fix. Right. That's a two-page application. And do you, do you help uh, do LGBT those. veterans with those? That, that's great. Okay. The so problem is that uh, more people suffered sort of, you know, persecution for their sexual orientation. Right. And then the DD-214 actually says misconduct. And so... Yeah, because they lashed out or they were defending themselves or whatever the... Or, yes, or, you know, they were late and the commanding officer you know, we call it sort of death by a thousand paper cuts. They were called out for all these tiny things that might have been let slide with a different service member. Yeah. Uh, but, and your office, uh, you guys deal with those types yes. of... Yeah, okay. And then, but is that, particularly with female veterans, is that a, a barrier to get access to health care? Is that... Uh, Again, depends on the actual character of the discharge. Right. So if it just was a straight up, um, you know, but it's, it's rare, it's rare that it was just a straightforward, I'm yay, okay, we're discharging you with an honorable. I would love the administration to see if we can get a breakdown out of the 211,000 veterans that are still living in the five boroughs, or roughly, how many have other than honorable discharges? That would be really interesting. It's at least, we estimate, at very minimum 20,000. 20,000 is a lot of people in yeah. five boroughs. And that's really conservative. I mean, that, that's a lot of people. So those are 20,000 people that don't get access to VA health care, that don't qualify for other programs that the government is funding, even through nonprofits. That's very concerning to me. So I don't know, but I'd like the administration to see if they can whittle that number down, just so that we have it, and maybe that's the topic of a future hearing about how we're working to engage them, reach out to them, and help the ones that are able to be helped. I mean, some of them you can't help. There are other things going on or other you know, circumstances and, you know, they sealed their own fate when they did whatever. But for other people, it might be easier. Yeah, yeah. Um, Samantha. I would also just like to say, I don't know if the DVS data is broken down by gender, but there's such a dearth of information on women veterans um, nationwide 
that if that study is broken down by gender, if it could be in future iterations, that would be Well, DOD, wonderful. the fact that I'm, I'm amazed that they gave it to the city because the council had requested similar information years ago and they denied us. They're very protective of that information. But if DVS has it, you know, they're not allowed to share it with anybody. They can't give me the names of the people in my district, for instance, but, um, but they can certainly slice and dice it any way that they need to for research purposes and also for pu making public policy decisions. So I'd be really fascinated to see that. I mean, I'd like to see it on age. I'd like to see it on discharge status. I'd like to see it on gender. And we know it by borough already. But the more information that we can look at, the, the better we are able to make informed decisions about directing money or making changes to the law in terms of accommodation or public policy. So I just think it's interesting. Coco, I want to thank you in particular for waiting so patiently, so long. I saw you sitting in the back of the room from the beginning, and uh, uh, I didn't pick the order of speakers. That was my, the, the, the committee. The commi that was the committee council here. So uh, anyway, I, as you know, I showed up late. I was just given the cards to read. So, uh, but uh, anyway, I'm just kidding. Every voice is important, and every opinion matters, even the ones I disagree with. And, uh, and I want to thank you. You've always been here, especially since day one. You, I think you were one of the original five people that I often talk about. You were one of the original. It was you, Ed Daniels, Kristen, Joe, Joe and who, was, who else was there in the room? I literally walked in, and, and I thought I was in the wrong place because I just said there, was, there is no way that this is the Veterans Committee. But here we are, and you had a jam-packed audience, and we had a real city agency, and they were testifying and talking about facts and figures and numbers, and we had providers, uh, uh, experts in the field from healthcare and government and nonprofit, and we're just all swimming in the same direction trying to do some really good work. So I want to thank, thank you, but thank everybody for coming today. And that concludes today's hearing. Thank you. Thank you.